All right, so let me say, um, I have been reading, I read four research papers in my environmental ethics class. And the best one was the one that had handed it to me quite a while ago when I got to work with her. Um, and if you've handed in your research paper, these ones were handed in, you know, a while ago. So I gave the students, those students, a chance to rewrite. But I can't, I can't give people chances to rewrite now. I would have a hundred papers or something. So um, actually, I'd have more than that. But let me just tell you what I'm seeing, so that you can think about it. Okay. Um, in my classes, I the material is not in a textbook, right? I draw from a lot of sources, but I try to teach readings that do connect with each other. So you can see the connections, right? And you can, uh, you know, you can answer the question, why? Why does Damasio say this stuff? We'll talk about that today, right? Why does he think the goal of life is homeostasis, you know, this wonderful natural synthesis of your emotions and your actions and your thoughts. And then he comes and says, nature is cruel and we have to fight against her. You guys, isn't that just kind of like, what? And then you go and say, you have to ask why? Like, why does he say that? Well, you go back to that worshiping of Apollo and that view that science is about manipulating nature, right? The blank slate. And so Mr. Damasio has this combination of a blank slate and we can use these drugs to completely solve the problems of addiction, whatever. And we're gonna be totally home homeostasis. This is our natural biological way of operating. And then, you know, I mean, and then he says, except that nature is cruel and evil and out to get us. <laughs> and it gets approved like three Nobel prize winners. Oh, this is great stuff. What is this, right? And so I think I've taught you the worldviews that have led to this crazy, crazy conclusion. And I, I teach it to students at AUW because of the influence that the West has. It's, you know, it's trying to export its belief system as well as its drugs, right? So the drugs and the belief system and the money motive and the power motive, they're all woven together. And so, um, so, that relates to your research papers, okay? So what, if you have a thesis, um, so now I'm gonna have to switch to an example I had of a student and if in Afghanistan, she said people in the winter time, the pollution is terrible in Kabul because people are burning anything they can find to heat their houses. And you know when they're heating them indoors, they breathe in this stuff and they get asthma. And then there's just, there's smoke all over the city. And then at the end of the paragraph, she says, this paper is gonna be about water pollution and air pollution in uh, Afghanistan. And I'm like, wait a sec. <laughs> How did you get from there to there for one thing? And then, um, she was explaining, so again, I, I will make an analogy with this class, but she was, she gave one example of air pollution and another, and then sort of at the end of that section had seven examples, but she hadn't mentioned a few of the other ones, right? So it, it just was not organized, right? So the thesis would be, um, 
all major environmental problems are interconnected because nature is interconnected and our relationship to nature is very interconnected. This paper will talk about air pollution and water pollution in Afghanistan. It will give seven examples of air, why Afghanistan is particularly hit with this and five ways that it's particularly hit with water pollution and the connection between them, right? That's the thesis. And then first, blah, right? Or something like the first four are about law and then paragraph or two on that. The last three are particularly focused on blah, right? And then in general, the air pollution problem is blah. And then you go, and it's connected to water pollution, particularly in this way. And these three aspects, blah. <laughs> then there's also this other stuff, blah, and then the conclusion. So in your psychology, right, your thesis, you might come up with research about um, Cognitive behavioral therapy is a uh, popular in Bangladesh or something like that, right? Um, and then the way it's conducted or something, but this paper is gonna explain, right? How Bangladeshis have adapted this therapy to their country, uh, why, you know, where the funding comes from, how much government support they get, whether the culture supports it, whether their religious beliefs uh, uh, lead people to resist, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, whatever you want to say, um, but you just show that, uh, and then you could say, I also want to consider if this is just another kind of colonialization, you know, colonialism, or if it really is helping Bangladeshi. So is it just making money for the West? Is it promoting uh, non-Western societies to absolutely believe that the West is a superior culture and they should do everything they can to be like it? Um, and then, you know, you explain what's going on and blah, 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 blah. And then you draw some conclusion, right? Um, but you try to, when you get your points together, try to show, you know, these three are particularly important for this reason, but these other ones are also important for this reason. Um, this one looks like it's not connected or Westerners really don't understand the power of religion in people's lives. So when they come to engage in therapy, they don't understand they need to persuade uh, people or religious leaders. They need to find a way to um, uh, find a place in the culture that is respectful of religion, doesn't demonize religion, something like that. Anyway, my main uh, point is that, well, I mean, you can even do things like um, the way these therapies are performed in a developing country or my country or whatever, uh, reflects this gap between science and religion that started out with the enlightenment, right? And you can blah, blah, blah. <laughs> or the way it's conducted treats people as if they're blank slates, which they're not, <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, anyway, I, and I, I like working with students on their thesis statement. That's why I used to require that you meet with me and make an outline because I like, I like thinking like this. Obviously, I've been thinking like this since I was a kid. I was asking why, I mean, I was pretty bad. I would get two facts and it was sort of come up with a theory, you know, but that, that is what I like to do. So when students come, usually 
I'm able to help them make those connections. And then they can have their thesis. And then like the, the topic sentence for the paragraph, and it can all fit together. Now, some of you are really good at that on your own, like you don't need me. So, but the main thing is I'm not going to require you to come, but I can't rewrite your paper, right? And you, the grade will be lower. Even if you have really interesting things to say, I have to grade you on whether it's a good paper. And I do this because I want you to move forward in your academic career and then in your career career. And, the, and you're not going to be able to move forward unless you learn these basic skills. I do think it's a part of Western hegemony that you have to learn English and you have to be good at it, all this stuff. It, but, but I'm not, none of us has the power to resist that. And so what I can do is help you. So if you wanna eventually do some good for your country that satisfies you and you get you know, the best choices of what do I like to do and, and what can I get the credentials to do, I want all of you to be able to do that. And I can help you with your writing, but um, that's, that's why it's not because I'm like, oh my gosh, there were two English professors in my school that were just like grammar mechanics and they were meanies, you know? <laughs> they would be mean about, you know, hey, you, you did this wrong. and. Um, and they, they weren't very kind to people. You know, they just basically were like car mechanics. And, and they went home and they lived alone. And they just loved, you know, sort of going at a paper and correcting the grammar. I was just, that's not me, right? I just do it because I think about the student moving forward in their life. Um, I also think about that I had a number of students come to me for help about applications for a semester abroad or for a Fulbright because I've, I got a Fulbright grant and I have been reading proposals. Um, but the trouble is this one girl, it just wasn't written well at all. And so I basically rewrote it. And then I told her, this is, you've got to rewrite it to make it your own. You know, I've just done it in my voice. I've done it the way that's familiar to me. Um, but she told me, I can't, I can't rewrite it. Like every time I try to think about it, one of your sentences comes to mind. <laughs> but the trouble with that is that eventually you'll get caught, right? So if somebody else writes your application and you get into grad school or you get the job and you're asked to write something and you can't write it, you know, it exposes you, right? AUW owes you to have taught your, you know, learned that. But it exposes the college too. But, you know, again, there's no split between what exposes the college and what exposes you. That's, you know, that's a nice thing about working for a school that has a good mission is that to do the mission is also to help the student. Um, but anyway, that's my <laughs> spiel about papers, the research paper. And the final paper is that you really have to weave it together, but you don't have to find other research. You can just take the materials that I've taught and in my mind, of course, they weave together in a lot of ways, right? And I have um, taught this class before and each student weaves it together in a different way because it's a creative activity, right? You're creating your own model. Um, hopefully the last paragraph will be something like, when I started this class, I didn't think about this at all, but I'm starting to think about it. And I think going away, you know, after this class, I have developed something of a habit of thinking about this, right? What do I want? What is my vision of a healthy psyche? How can I get there? And also 
find a friend, right? An AUW sister or somebody, don't try to go at it alone. Um, somebody else who's had this class, you know, you could say, hey, I'm thinking about a healthy psyche because I'm kind of uh, right now. I don't know where I'm going. And then she could talk to you or something like that. Um, all right. So that's a lot of a chatter. But um, I are there any questions about the paper? And then I'm sorry that I won't be able to make a lot of comments at this point. I have so much stuff coming in. Okay. All right, so we have three different readings, right? Three different chapters. And so I was going to um, have you comment on each chapter. Um, the first excerpt from the chapter um, was, I think it was nature is cruel and indifferent, right? And we have to, we have to, um, nature, uh, makes us suffer, right? We have to, uh, let me find the page number. Um, suffering and death are horrible. Okay, chapter 11, six through 14. Let me find it. And what I wanted you to think about, <laughs> wait a sec, didn't he just say the opposite? What is this? Um, Okay, chapter 11, Nature, Suffering and Death, Religion and Faith. So, um, nature is cruel, indifferent, and evil <laughs> compared to what we've read before. And um, yeah, okay. So, what did you think of that? That way of thinking about nature and then thinking about science, right? He and his drugs are gonna like be the heroes, which sounds like Francis Bacon to me. And I think a student said that, right? Knowledge is power, power over nature. But he was, you know, Spinoza would say, you're trying to make your mind into a macrocosm. You're trying to fit into the natural world. It's the exact opposite of what Spinoza was about. And <laughs> So I'm wondering if other people had this cognitive problem trying to figure out what the heck he's doing or if it made complete sense to you. Okay, Moza, what do you say? Professor, could you please repeat that question? I'm sorry. What? Uh, could you please repeat that? Okay, I mean, the main theme of the first part of the assignment, the chapter, is that nature is cruel, indifferent, and evil because we die and we physically suffer and science is gonna come in there and be the hero, you know, and save us from addiction, pain, violence, and depression. Do you wanna do you wanna pass for now and just somebody else can go? Yeah, Professor, that would be nice for me. Okay. Thank so you. Isabel, do you have a comment? Is there anybody who wants to jump in there? <laughs> Fardeen, go for it, Fardeen. Yes. Uh, hello, Professor. So uh, it was interesting to me that he called nature cruel and indifferent and he has this sort of, I don't know, to me, an unhealthy attitude about uh, looking at death because he had all this uh, emphasis on having homeostasis as a goal. But to me, if you, if you can't have a um, healthy attitude towards nature and death and it's just... It's a part of life, it's something that happens. And like, if you have that kind of negativity and fear about it, then to me, you can't really achieve homeostasis. And he, he went on a lot about that in the beginning. So it doesn't quite go together uh, in my head. That's what I had to say. 
Were you surprised to read that? Um, well, after he, after what he said about the addiction thing, I wasn't really surprised because it wasn't like he, his viewpoint seemed very cohesive at that point, but yeah, it was just interesting. Okay, good. Who wants to go next? Anybody want to? Ashlyn, go for it. Uh, yes, Professor. As for Dean Toll, that is one of the points I also uh, got to notice, like how he, uh, how the irony exists when he actually wants the homeostatic statistic state to be uh, to happen, but at the same time he is telling the nature to be cruel when we consider nature as an important part in our life. So I just wanted uh, other people or him to reason himself or think that how how you can how someone can um, tell or at least state that the nature is deliberately do things that we are getting uh, like getting from the nature. for example if if there is some uh, landslides or some kind of things that is happening from the nature how how can someone tell that the nature deliberately is doing it because uh, it is something that nature does on purpose how why can't they actually think that it's because of the it's because of the consequences that we have done to the nature in order to improve the technology or in order to uh, improve Im do improvisation in terms of the scientific things and because we are using nature as a tool why why can't they think from that perspective these consequences or these kind of natural disasters are happening to us rather than what make people or what make him to think that it is because it is how nature is and how manipulative it is when some people read it right so that's one of the points that come to my mind when i read it how can you have homeostasis if you're totally detached from the earth right exactly yeah yeah pretty crazy okay amal what do you think yeah i think like the way he uh, measure things is very sorry yeah uh, it's very simple like um it, it just like based on non-religious and scientific uh method like and and it's you know um it contradicts with the greek history uh they say that um, yeah, it's not that easy to you know, just replace your feelings. For example, the fear of death. Uh, I found that interesting. Like uh, he said, like we can just replace it with positive feelings, but that's not possible in the Greek history. Like you, you need to face it and uh, accept suffering in some way, like and work hard to leave a legacy in this world. Um, and like uh, for calling the nature uh, evil, <laughs> I found like um, I found it interesting because uh, like this, just blaming the nature for the things happen for the bad things. Um, yeah, I think that's not reasonable because it's like the the evil the idea of evil here is not in the nature itself, but in you know in the human choices. Um, because, yeah, they lived in this place where, you know, the disaster is to happen or something. Uh, so I was relating to that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I just like the idea that, like, the, how the Greek history agree on, you know, facing the tragedy and try to resolve, you know, many things by wisdom. And, uh, like, it's not uh, compatible with uh, what Damasio says. Can you also go back to um, Francis Bacon, John Locke, uh, utilitarianism, right? Mr. Damasio yeah. is going to make you happy. Yeah, it's just focus, he's just focused on the future. So, well, pleasure, pain, and happiness, right? Yeah. He, yeah. And then also Kant, you know, maybe these principles, right? He's just. Um, imposing it on nature nature's a silly putty it's just the background there yeah it's pretty th okay so you sort of understood that that's good um who else let's see who's next uh ratika out there 
Um, Diana? Not there. Aisha? Uh, yes, Professor. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the Messias view was much more an unhealthy approach towards me. I felt it's like this. I mean, um, it can also decrease our tolerance level towards uh, the, you know, the calamity of the natures and everything. So, and another thing I'd like to mention is uh, he separated our internal homeostasis with the biosphere and ecosphere of that homeostasis. So I don't understand how it can be uh, separable. <laughs> it, together with these two, we are like the living beings and the nature itself. We are interacting with the nature and everything. So it didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Yeah, that's it uh, for now. <laughs> well, doesn't it worry you a bit that lots of money is going into this stuff? Okay. Mark Zuckerman's uh, wife is a pediatrician. He gave a ton of money to neuroscience. Um, and, you know, he, so. He, I mean, in my mind, I think, oh, we're going to rewire the brain, right? And we're going to make people happy. And yet he has Facebook that he's making money in a way that, you know, punches people's buttons that you can measure is destroying them, right? Because it's cultivating fear and false fantasies and all this crap that is the opposite of wisdom. And he's making a ton of money on it. And it doesn't occur to him right? that on the one hand, his product is, is creating completely dysfunctional psyches, but he's going to put neuroscience and rewire us. <laughs> what the heck? Does that make sense? Yes, Professor. I feel like sometimes uh, he is also like, um, what? Coloring the neuroscience itself. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it should not be like this, but it's being like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I read it, I, you know, this is like a caricature. This is like something you would speculate. There's some dodo thinking like this, you know, and then you find out it's not that bad. Well, it is that bad. <laughs> and all these neuros, you know, all these, uh, award winners, right? The highest award winners, they love this stuff. So that means they're sitting in their, in their offices or their labs, and that's how they think of themselves. Oh, <laughs> okay, Masoma, what do you think? Hi, Professor. Uh, professor, I, I think, yeah, I found this uh, article very interesting, but then also when it comes to Daimos, I, I found it very annoying. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, uh, Professor, yeah, this is uh, the idea that nature is cruel or, you know, indifferent or it is, uh, uh, we suffer because of it and that's why maybe we need drugs. <laughs> I don't know, like, but then, uh, Professor, I was thinking, apart from this, uh, this is one argument. I mean, whether you agree that nature is cruel or not, but then apart, even if we agree that, okay, really nature is cruel, but then is there no way without drugs that we can adapt with this nature? We can understand how nature is good. I mean, I mean, we can find a way. We are human beings. We have the rational ability. We can learn from our history, from our past generations. Uh, I mean, all, Dimozo, I mean, undermine all of the disabilities and all of this. I mean, the history that people, how people adapt, how people learn from the history, how they like flourish or, or maybe go backward uh, because of this kind of ideas. I mean, you pointed out all of this point in the article and I really liked. Uh, and also the part that you mentioned that um, apart from this, that, you know, it, it was well organized by Apollyon, I mean, this uh, uh, Greek tragedy they have, I mean, uh, this kind of artistic value, but then it does not mean that we should, you know, value it because of what they are saying or, uh, or that, uh, I mean, 
Professor, do you understand me? I mean, uh, I value the artistic value, but then, yeah, it doesn't mean that they are right and they pe people should follow whatever they are saying. So, yeah, I I found uh, also Dimas, Dimasio, I, I cannot pronounce even the name correctly, but then I found it very annoying, Professor. <laughs> well, okay, so the artistic thing is about, you know, if you ever get time to read the other chapters, but, you know, you got a lot to do and I don't, but um, they do want a microcosm and the macrocosm, right? And so they're just, but they know that it doesn't, Spinoza just sits there and talk yourself out of it. If you remember those couple of quotes, you just talk yourself out. He says, pride is passive because it depends on other people and you have to just not worry about that and just turn, you know, to the intellectual love of God, just remind yourself what really matters and don't worry about what other people think of you. Okay, fine, whatever. But the Greeks don't do it that way. And I think on a neuroscience model of neural mapping, they would, the, the artist thinks, okay, pride, let me find an example of somebody who was guilty of pride, right? So yeah, Agamemnon, was so full of himself that he went and, um, oh, okay. So uh, Paris stole, I don't know if you guys know this story, um, but anyway, so Paris stole Helen and that was bad. And so Agamemnon could have negotiated, right? But he really wanted to use it as an excuse to just show how powerful he is, you know? We're going to show the world we're more powerful than those Trojans. And he ends up having to kill his daughter before he can go, <laughs> which is uh, somebody who's obsessed with power and money is never going to be home, and their children are going to get crippled for it. And so people, you know, are, are watching this and going, I get that. I understand why you'd want to just prove it. And then all of a sudden they realize, oh, there's a huge price to pay. And then that, you know, their neural mapping, the map that said, you know, power's great is going to go me, me, me. <laughs> and then they're going to rewire their neural map. So they're going to take those emotions and turn them into feelings, according to Damasio's model of the psyche, right? Um, so he doesn't, but Damasio goes and makes all the mistakes in the book, <laughs> right? He's guilty of pride, right? Science is going to save us. I mean, he, he goes and does all the things that the Greeks would say, you don't do that, Mr. Damasio. Does that make sense, Ms. Soma? Yes, yeah, Professor. I mean, Professor, he himself is saying that nature is cruel and we cannot do anything about the date and this thing, but then why he's saying that, you know, science, science can, <laughs> can do something to, you know, heal the suffering. Uh, I mean, it's inconstant uh, in my sense. How can science do that? I'm, I'm, uh, I think like he's just applying her drugs and medicines and saying that I'm very powerful. Uh, I should be proud that I, I come up with this idea of neuroscience and I'm making drugs uh, that's useful, but uh, he ignore uh, uh, the history that how, I mean, people can be healed and there are other ways and people can understand the nature. Uh, I mean, even if we agree that nature is cruel, but then I myself don't think that nature is cruel. Uh, I'm disagree with this point, but then, yeah, it's how people uh, interpret it and then use it for their maybe one goal. Yeah, like you could write a whole tragedy with Mr. Damasio as the tragic character, right? He... Yeah, professor. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. But the other thing is he gets all this money from the U.S. government. Neuroscience gets a, a buttload of money. And it doesn't go into environmental protection. So, you know, you have all these people taking these depression drugs or whatever, but
but then there's a mudslide that covers up their house. I mean, you know, that's not going to solve their depression, right? If they're exactly. yeah, if they're subject to more and more extreme climate, how can you take a pill to cure them of what is it, depression or stress? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, unless unless that pill can get you to live in la la land where you don't even notice what's going on around you it just makes no sense at all right Ms. Exactly, Professor. yes yes i mean they should they should look at the root cause of the depression maybe if you have a problem i mean for instance if you have a uh, problem at home with your parents or maybe with your relationship you're depressed but then taking those drugs will, won't help so you have to solve your problem right first of all with your relationship. And I, I also um one of the students asked me to do a little video about how giving advice about how you how a w students should deal with stress so it's actually on my youtube channel i put it I don't know, I can't even remember what what playlist it's on, but anyway, um, the idea is that, first of all, you acknowledge AUW students on average have a lot of stress. And so first you validate it, like they're stressed out because there's a lot to be stressed out about, that's why. <laughs> In other words, it's an appropriate reaction. It's just that when you start overreacting, and your body chemistry starts getting in these feedback loops, right? You can't function. So, um, but you do have to start out validating it, right? And then you have to say, the pill might be able to help you uh, stop having those feedback loops where you can't stop having these reactions. But, you know, you have to, the power of your ideas, like Mr. Tomasio says, you've got to combine that. And you've got to see, you've got to do everything you can to get out of the situation <laughs> that's stressful. But of course, AUW students don't have a lot of options. Although if you're from Afghanistan, that's going to help a lot, right? You're going to be able to come. But um, but he doesn't, you know, he just, I, you know, you guys, all of you AUW students, you want a Mr. Demasio to come and give you this pill and say, no, you won't have stress anymore. Really? And you're going to go to, the, I mean, aren't you going to go, how much are you getting paid to do this, buddy? Let's trade places. You know, you come here and you take your pill and I'll go over to the U.S. and live the way you live. And, you know, you can have the stress pill. <laughs> It's it's yeah, not it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now did you have a reaction? Okay, let's see. What did Christina did she give me a message? Can't remember. Oh, okay, Falak. Okay, here's Falak. Um I like the point that Damasio's approach focuses upon the power of doctors to keep people alive and ignores the responsibility of doctors to tell people they should die when their time comes. I agree with this point because nowadays a doctor focuses on how to prolong the life of people whose bodies want to give up. Actually, Damasio doesn't, doesn't do that. I do that and I'm criticizing him because he doesn't do that. Um, he just says nature's cruel because we die, you know? So we're gonna, that's what science, it makes science so great is we can fight this aging process, whatever. But anyway, um, yeah, I do agree with um, Falak. And I do think it, the problem is even more egregious in a developing country where you don't have a lot of resources. And so if the West brings in all of its high tech, expensive stuff for whoever can pay for it or trying to get the government to pay for it, to keep dying bodies alive and to undermine the traditions that developing countries have had 
the cultural traditions that try to are designed to help people accept the death. And because in the past, there were not all those resources. People just had to accept death because the next generation needed resources and it was right there. Um, but today we're in that same situation. We're just in complete denial about that situation. And I think it would be agonizing uh, if it were true that and you guys know better than I do, that in developing countries, more and more money is spent on keeping people alive at the cost of all sorts of other stuff, air pollution, water pollution, childhood education, you know, everything else. Um, but it, I wouldn't be surprised. And then also companies that Western or uh, companies from outside that are making all the money and the politicians can't say no because they would get criticized and they would not win the next election. But just um, how this is becoming a part of colonialism, that would be something some of you might want to um, write your research paper on to see how many resources are being used in your country for, um, you know, old people to stay alive and then what the cost is in the country. Um, okay, so now is not feeling well. All right. Um, let's see, who's next? And Christina, did you say something in the chat or do you have something to say? Oh, it was Diana that said something. Christina, do you have something? Excuse me. How about you, Pooja? Professor, I am not feeling well. I have to go to hospital after a while, so I couldn't read. Oh, okay. Um, is there any reaction you have just on the basis of what we're talking about now? Can you get some idea? Or do you want to just comment? on something you've already read in Damasio? So I was uh, uh, I was listening to the comments that was on based of nature. So I think uh, <clears throat> nature is always not a full uh, Nature is not always responsible for destroying the things, I guess, but it's all about how human activities uh, have been uh, relating it to the nature and which is why even we can see the sounding or the environment nearby us, uh, how uh, human activities have shown, uh, I mean, toward the nature, for example, uh, if you see the forest or the land or because of these urbanizations and uh, uh, industrializations, I think I can connect in that way. I'm not sure whether I'll, I am on a right track, but I was thinking about that when my friends were commenting on that part. Okay, good. Um, so I'll call on Aurora and then we'll go back to Amal. And really, if anybody else wants to chip in, put up your little hand. I love it. Okay, Aurora, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Professor. I couldn't read because of some family issue. Okay. Um, all right. So go ahead, Amal. Uh, professor, what do you need me exactly to comment about? Oh, I, your hand is up. You have raised hand. Uh, I left it raised. Okay. Okay. All right. So the second chapter that I had you read, I had to read three of them, not the whole thing, but um, the natural quest for meaning and purpose. Also, Professor, can I Go ahead. ask you something? So I was trying to do, I was, I was going through my final paper and I was wondering if 
you can write a paragraph for what we are actually uh, supposed to do because in the first paper you have given us a lot of guidelines and it was so easy to go on a track and we i was literally following all the tracks that you have given in the first paper that we were supposed to write so i was wondering if you can manage a little time and write a little more paragraph so that we can follow the whole process and write our paper on that okay so so what i what i want to do for sure is to make sure what your what's on your mind is what you, what you want to say right and not trying to please me or trying to answer my question. That's why I tend not to say anything because students are trained, right? To do what the teacher says and they get punished if they don't. And so to me, philosophy is having a free mind, right? And each student is gonna write a different paper. But what I, what I like to do is have you come during office hours and talk to me about what uh, struck you. What was the most? What were some of the most important things that we read in this class, or ideas that really have stuck in your mind about, you know, a healthy psyche or how you want to live. Uh, internally, right? How you want to respond to life or whatever. So, um, I mean, I can go back and see the first paper was also what is a healthy psyche. So it might be very similar, um, but I can look at that and see if, if that seems productive. I, I just, I've seen students, you know, uh, if I say anything, they try to conform to my question. They say, I'm not sure I answered your question. It's like, ah, it's not about me, right? It's about you. Um, but I'll look at it and see if that, see if I can say something that I think is general enough that students don't conform their thought to what they think I want but they, they write what they want. Um, but again, if you feel you know at loose ends, you can wait till after class today and talk to me, or you can come during office hours. Um, so I, it's the office hours. See, I don't have classes, right? The rest of this week, I only have two more days where I actually have classes. And those are for final papers. But that means that the next seven days or so, eight days, I should, I'll have office hours. So I like to do that. I like to work with students on their thesis statements in either the research paper or the final paper. Um, is that okay, Pooja? But I will, I'll check it and see if I could write something about the final paper. Yes, Professor, thank you. I'll, I'll be on the office hours for sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I was talking to Nuchat about how to raise kids and why not to beat your children. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I mean, she's been twice and it's fun. I just like talking to her and I do think, you know, it helped her because she, she has a nephew and she does not like the way her sister-in-law is raising that kid. And so we just talk about it. And then, you know, I think I can help her envision what she wants to say, right? But it's what she wants to say. Um, but of course I have a lot of opinions. I have three kids <laughs> and I thought a lot about it when I was raising my kids. And um, now I have these grandkids and my children and their spouses think a lot about it. So that was, that's just one example of how coming to office hours lets people be creative. Um, that's why I like to do that. Um, 
Okay, so I think we've got the first round. Now the second round was about um, Damasio and Faith, okay? Um, so he talks about spiritual experiences are about living for the sake of something greater than yourself, uh, finding meaning and purpose, um, and he says that organized religion, he's not against organized religion, which, of course, given his situation, he has a whole lot of colleagues, other scientists that are against organized religion. So he's saying it doesn't have to be bad. It could be OK. <laughs> and, you know, when he says the golden rule is actually wired into our brains. We should really treat other people the way we want to be treated. And that's the way to homeostasis. And that's the only way to homeostasis. And then it occurs to him that religions aren't so bad. Well, the history of religions, one of the main reasons religions emerge at all is because of that need for meaning and also the golden rule. There's, a, you know, so, all right, Mr. Damasio, all right, you enlightenment scientists, you have to, you know, get over your anti-religion point of view. Um, but religion also involves not fearing death, right? So um, his remarks about institutional religions, I think are just too simplistic. Um, and he doesn't really, he doesn't acknowledge the complexity about religion. Like some religious positions um, can be good and some of them can really stoke racism and sexism and war and all sorts of stuff, right? So, he, I just think it's not a very nuanced, not a very complex understanding of the role of religion in people's lives and in history and culture, like Masoma said. If you just study the humanities, you would have a much more nuanced point of view. Um, so Amal, did you have a reaction to that chapter? Um, I, like I just skipped this chapter, um, and I think, uh, like for uh, like for the part where Demasio uh, discuss about religion, uh, so for example, uh, I want to give an example that I you know stood up to me, the like where the fear of death, you know, and when we compare it to the belief in the. Uh, immortality of soul and like this this will uh you know eliminate our fear of death um and yeah i just skimmed the rest of the chapter i actually focused on chapter 13 more okay so ashlyn uh professor so my, one of the responses i got from the second i'm sorry Second chapter is um, he uses the word tragedy for certain human conditioning. So uh, you have clearly mentioned that you also disagree with the fact that he uses the word tragedy for certain facts about the human condition, because I also um, agree with your point that it ignores and denies uh, the harm that we do in terms of the good or God. So in this, uh, it's like uh, he, he he uses, uh, okay, he, uses the uh, goal of education is it's like on the view of tragedy the goal of education is not completely told right he's using the concept of comfort and insulation so in that terms the kind of narrative so the uh, in that view the vision of an afterlife is given to the people again and it uh, kind of indirectly uh, discourages the people to uh, actually uh, actually come up with the ability of reasoning. So uh, 
so that's one of uh, that's one of the things that i have found so it actually indirectly it disables the um, idea of reasoning so the whole idea of reasoning is our main point that i got from the class so when we are uh, kind of uh, telling like imposing one idea or his idea of the tragedy kind of definition so it indirectly um, avoid the ability of reasoning so it's manipulating in that sense as well that is one of the points i got from the chapter okay good um isabel do you have something okay uh fardeen Are you there? Okay. Um, Aisha? Uh, yes, Professor. So I don't have so much response from this chapter, but I'd like to. Uh, mention one of your response. You say the power of choice gives us responsibility and forces us to desire to re examine our neural maps and to cons constantly improve them. So, um, I would like you to elaborate it a little bit more. I mean, any kind of examples. Because this line actually, I know what does it mean, uh, what it means, but. Um, I am a bit uh, confused how to explain it. That's all. Okay. Well, for example, um, so Damasio realizes, you know, he has this big insight that we're actually biologically wired to cooperate. And he thinks that's an evolutionary trait because over the millions of years of evolution, people who cooperated actually survived. Uh, it, was a, it was a better fit. It had better survival value than um, antagonism, competition. Uh, what's interesting is, of course, people will say it's natural, right, to be competitive. Some psychologists say that, right? Competition is natural and it's built into our genes and that's how people survive are the alpha males because they win the competition. And Mr. Damasio is saying, no, 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 no. The latest neuroscience is that cooperation is you know, evolutionarily more fit and then all our research has proven this and blah, blah. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's way too simplistic <laughs> because you have to contextualize this, right? So, you know, the idea that I could now in the name of science go out and say, I wanna treat everybody the way I wanna be treated. Ta-da, I mean, Nobody who goes to war says, I really want to screw over somebody and treat them the way I would never want to be treated. Usually they go because they're, they're, they feel like these, the enemy has distorted, right? They're out of sync. They're creating all this lack of homeostasis, right? It's, it's their fault. And they've created all this disruption. And so in order for us to get to a world where people do treat each other according to the golden rule, we have to go to war. I mean, <laughs> right? Or they all, you know, it's always in the name of some good or that the world would be a better place. Hitler, you know, <laughs> Hitler, not only did he blame the Jews for everything, but he also said technology is going to mean we have to have really smart people who know how to run the technology. That's why we have to have the Aryan race. 
<laughs> so, I mean, he just doesn't seem to understand the history of humankind is the history of people who have this idea of the good that drives them. And religion has been able to help that or to really harm that. Religion is very powerful. But once you, the idea of the golden rule is not going to all of a sudden change people or change history because that's always somewhere in their justification for war. Um, Ashlyn, is your hand up? Yes, Professor. So one of the things that I found interesting is towards the end of the chapter, it is written when we when he uh, is over glorifying the idea of science that science can save you from everything and anything. So it is very similar to the idea of promoting bad institutional religion, right? So it, it's yes. like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's given like, in the sense, it is exactly like the bad institutional religion that if you believe in God, uh, he will save them. So it's exactly the uh, same thing. So uh, that that found I found it interesting. So when he over glorifies science, that science can save you from anything and everything that you're facing. So it's very manipulating and uh, yeah, exactly the same as what religious like bad in a religious institution does. Okay, now you can go back and remember utilitarianism. And John Stuart Mill said, we're going to build a whole culture based on empathy, because by nature, people have empathy with other people. So he's, can you under, I mean, the next thing is to go back and think about why I had you reading all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all connected. So, so that's what Bentham, right? Bentham and John Stuart Mill are trying to take our animal nature you know, we're just animals, we're just fancy animals, right? And then John Stuart Mill is, is saying, yeah, empathy is natural. And so it's a lot like Damasio saying we're wired to cooperate. Um, but I mean, isn't Damasio going to learn anything from, you know, that didn't necessarily work out so well, right? I mean, we've, that didn't solve the world's problems. Not only that, but we have people like Chris Hedges pointing out that positive psychology, even today, right, is using the same stuff. So, hey, Mr. Damasio, uh, get out of your office. Would you come down into the real world and talk to some, I mean, don't you read history, Mr. Damasio? Like, don't you get this sense that you're just another one of those historical characters that's making all these mistakes, right? Exactly, Actually, exactly, Professor. And, and I have read in the second chapter somewhere, I couldn't uh, really remember the line, but he has some kind of neural mapping in his uh, mind, like this, these are, are good, and this is how he's kind of trying to impose that same kind of neural mapping to the others. So that I, I'm just surprised to see how manipulative his ideas are. And yeah. How... <laughs> yeah, I mean, he himself says ideas, ideas cause ideas. Oh, wow. You know, gee, <laughs> gee, Mr. Exactly. DeVazio, what a thought. <laughs> but I mean, the whole history, if you study humanities, that's what humanities is, is the story of the ideas people had. Mm -hmm. and how they drove history. And so, I mean, this is, I guess, one thing I hope you get out of this is that the humanities are marginalized and they're marginalized at AUW for the same reason, you know, I mean, you can't fight it, mm -hmm. right? Just like, I'm not gonna tell you not to learn English and not to get good at it because you can't fight that. And so, but we still have these writing seminars and we have these weird courses, like there's always a few teachers around. <laughs> uh, but you should understand that I'm tapping into the notion of the mind, the assumption that ideas are powerful, that they do drive human history, and that ideas about God or ideas about related to what we call religions which are the good life, right? Hindus, Buddhists, this is well-established stuff. And it has an idea, but it also has a lot of science behind it, right? Hindu chakras, Hindu diet, 
these people really knew what they were doing. They linked their homeostasis. Mm -hmm. I mean, hello. <laughs> Hindus know a lot more about homeostasis, Mr. Damasio. And so it didn't occur to them that all that Hindu chakra stuff and all that diet yoga stuff, he doesn't even mention it, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't yeah, mention yeah. Buddhism and Buddhist meditation. Yeah, go ahead. I, oh, sorry, Professor, sorry for the interruption. I, I was also thinking when you told this point, so when he was telling the whole thing about the religion and stuff, uh, below that you have written, so there are this religion which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, kind of um, um, connecting this reason and faith idea, and they are finding... Uh, uh, whether there are ways of immortality and you have written something something so he's not even considering that thing he's completely blindly telling something against the religion but there are uh, the religion is also doing its uh, its job like connecting the re, uh, re, the faith and uh, reasoning thing so he's completely you know ignoring that portion i guess it's like just his idea of um, you know uh, he his idea of neural mapping and this is how things are going to be yeah that's just his subjective point of view, I, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't occur to him that he should check out Hinduism, right? Mm -hmm. Check out Buddhism. Check out the fact that Islam was pro-science. You know, it wasn't anti-science. Um, you could say nowadays there are branches that are humanistic and branches that are anti-science. But... Um, his own model of Spinoza is just a guy that uses Apollonian reasoning, mm -hmm. right? To rewire the brain. And it's just these other cultures were way more sophisticated. And, you know, the people had much better neural maps than you do, Mr. Damasio. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta redo your map, you know? Exactly. <laughs> um, so I, I gotta let you guys take a break. Um, so, uh, if it's okay, I think I'll let you do 15 minutes. If that seems like a long time, just go ahead and write your post, right? That's what I was, that's why I was giving you longer time and it will just be one break. But if you want to just sit down and start writing your post right away, or at least, you know, the part about comments made in class that would make life easier. Um, okay, so here's Fardeen. Good. Um, let me let me do this. I think let me check to see what other uh, students have commented here. Um, okay, Fardeen. While reading chapter 12, it really felt like Damasio did not adequately explore religion. It more seemed like he was trying to um, tie the idea of religion to his concept of neuroscience and homeostasis in a convenient way. Yes, <laughs> very good, Fardeen. Uh, you could, he's very self-serving in the end, even though he thinks he's open-minded and he's open to all this new kind of exploration, but he certainly doesn't model that. Every time he gets to a new issue, his conclusions are very self-serving. Um, so everybody understand, you understand that, Ashland? <laughs> You're the only face. Okay. I just wish I, could... I was I... just thinking the whole idea, a whole lot of the irony that is happening with this idea. What he wants is uh, something and what he does for that and what his ideas are very different from that. So it's completely All right. Different. So, okay, for 15 minutes, you get a break, but, okay, and Masoma, I'll call on you before we break, but for the rest of you, I want you to think about what a feminist would say about this. Is, is he sexist? Is, he, is this patriarchy, right? Because the God Apollo was, let's just, I'll talk about the God Apollo for a minute. Again, Masoma, I'll get to you. But, um, let me just present this to you so you can think during the break and everybody can have something to say. So the chapter in the God Apollo said that there are lots, each one represents some energies in society that they're all important. 
And so Apollo is the god of reason, right? And he's the god of science and math and um, actually logic and reasoning and also speaking and being persuasive, all that, you know, mental stuff. But he's emotionally immature. Okay, so he chases nymphs, uh, you know, sexy young women who he has no respect for. He chases them. And then if they reject him, he gets really mad and he takes revenge. He's really a nasty SOB. Okay, he needs a lot of education about women. And then he's also indifferent to justice and injustice. And that's where I'm saying, Mr. Damasio, when you knew how powerful the effect of these drugs on the brain, it's unconscionable that you didn't warn people, right? And that you didn't get neuroscientists on every advisory board and absolutely obsess about controlling access to these drugs. And so you're not, you never even talk about justice and questions of justice. And, um, and regulation and laws. He never even considers it, right? But that's like Apollo. Apollo is just like that. He's so obsessed and he keeps giving mankind these wonderful new toys and gifts, honestly, in the myths. And everybody goes, oh, and then it falls apart. <laughs> I mean, geez, it's, unbelievable how he just follows a storyline of one of the, the Greek gods. It drives me nuts, but it's also history. Um, Masoma, what have you got? Uh, yeah, Professor, I was I agree with Ashlyn and also for, uh, for Dean, like they mentioned that, you know, maybe uh, uh, Demasio uses uh, the religion here uh, to tie his idea with, uh, you know, religion with the uh, this idea, like his idea of neuroscience. And then especially when it comes to the Greek uh, uh, goddesses and they, <laughs> uh, all these things. When I was reading about the goddesses, professor, I had very little idea. And then I found a lot of like, uh, maybe in, uh, for instance, in the Apollo story, if we see that how uh, immature he was emotionally and how he uh, treated women, uh, I mean, uh, like when it comes to other gods, all of them are like having very immature behavior in some way or another in, in one situation. I mean, uh, so I think like he uses especially the Greek goddesses and saying that see, even gods have this, and then uh, we have to. This is nature. I mean, we have uh, we have to come up with another idea. I mean, we have to have drugs maybe to you know uh, heal the suffering or all. But then. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, he completely sim uh, ignored uh, uh, other religions and very simple, simplized this idea. So, yeah, I was just wanted to mention this, Professor. I think he particularly focusing on the Greek religion in a purpose. <laughs> okay, good. So let's take a break. But I coming back, I want you to think about to what extent does this have to do with male domination, right? Apollo, the god of reason. How is, you know, what's his attitude toward his sister, the goddess of the wilderness, right? <laughs> Nature. And what does that have to do with patriarchy, right? So, so I want to ask you after the break, how does this resonate with patriarchy, male domination, and colonialism. One more wave of Westerners coming in with their science, technology, superiority complex, and imposing it on developing countries for their good, right? So that they can develop. All right, I gotta stop. We'll take 15 minutes. I have 22 past the hour right now. Um, and then I have a couple students that just arrived. So I'll probably talk to them during the break. Okay, take a break, guys. All right, Saida, are you there?
Yes, okay. Um, well, could you during the break, could you type in some res response to the reading? And then I can read it to the students. Okay, good. All right. And if anybody else wants to do any more typing in the chat, I finally have gotten comfortable enough with talking and checking the chat. I took me a while. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a break.
Okay, I hope everybody's there. Um, all right, so my question was, when he's talking about nature, um, what would a feminist say, right? Is this going to be a sexist? Is there sexism in this? Um, okay, okay. So Saida did say something. Oh, okay. She says, I want to talk about accepting death and living a complete uh, life. To be honest, I don't really fear my own death, but I do a lot about my loved ones. Um, I lost my grandmother. She used to live with us. Before that, she was in the hospital. She couldn't react or eat. Uh, but still, I didn't think she would die. One day um, during my final exam, she died. It was uh, like a bolt. The first time I'd faced something like that. Um, yeah, but I had a final exam the next day, right? Uh, I got sick. Um, I think I got traumatized and PTSD after that. Okay, couldn't be alone in a room. It took years to get better. Um, Okay, so, all right, so the death of her grandmother, um, which, you know, again, I always love student stories about the grandparents because I didn't really, I hardly ever saw my grandparents and my parents were not close to their parents. So I, you know, my grandparents did not play a role in my life at all. But a lot of my students, they did. So that's always interesting. Um, yeah, uh, the thing about Damasio is this is another issue. And then I'm going to get to the sexism. And I do want you all to, um, OK. OK, so now they do more things as a family. Um, so the grandmother's death helped them understand how much they value each other, which is good. But, okay, let's take that fear of death. That is a major driver for the belief in immortality of the soul, right? And the belief in immortality of the soul is a major driver in behavior that can both be very good or very bad, right? Uh, when people go to war, the politicians virtually every time say God, right? God is on our side. So if you die, you'll go to heaven, right? Very powerful. 
Um, so, I mean, the idea that religions, he just has such an oversimplified view of the power of religion and the power of the fear of death and the power of people seeking meaning and purpose in life and um, how religion, you know, institutional religion. I mean, all he says is it doesn't have to be bad. Actually, there are narratives for, let's see, prayer and rituals in the context of a re religious narrative are meant to produce spiritual experience, yes. Uh, for most people, uh, the fear of death, physical pain, and mental anguish lead them to a deeply felt religious faith or a protective insulation against sorrow of any kind. All right. Uh, all right. I mean, I can accept that people use religion to feel comfortable or whatever, but, you know, just the desire to feel better and blah, blah, leads people to use religion to do very, very wicked things, right? To, to justify war and massacre and um, genocide. And I mean, Mr. Damasio, like really, and it's all because they want comfort and they want insulation and they want homeostasis. And, and they want meaning and purpose. But he just doesn't think about how that isn't the beginning. That isn't the end of figuring out the truth. That's just the beginning. That's saying, oh, you have to be really careful about this because we do seek meaning and purpose. That means in order to satisfy that need, we're gonna tell ourselves a lot of lies. And we're going to delude ourselves and we're going to invent this uh, God or this uh, eternal life. And that's going to be dangerous. And it might not be, but in human history, it's a powerful trigger. So he, Damasio doesn't understand the power of religion for evil, just like he didn't understand the power of his drugs and the dopamine and the serotonin for evil, right? He just that does not have a nuanced view. His neural maps are too simple. He needs to like, you know, add a few, <laughs> get a little more complicated view of human life. Um, and, um, ah, then the story of, that not only the world's religions were unifying reason and faith, right? Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Islam was not anti-science, et cetera. Um, there was also the fact that the heroes, the icons of these traditions, Socrates, Jesus, Buddha, um, numerous, the ones, Muhammad, people who history, sets up as uh, a high standard, right? A high quality of life, a model to look up to. They didn't seek homeostasis. They sought justice and truth, even though they knew they could get killed for it, right? This is not seeking homeostasis. <laughs> Right, Muhammad almost got killed. He ran out of, got out of town just in time because they're standing up to corruption. Socrates did the same thing. Jesus did the same, right? They speak truths to power and they get themselves in deep trouble and they know that they're taking a risk. It, that's moral courage. They're not seeking homeostasis. And when Damasio advises us, you know, that that's natural and that's great, we're not paying attention to the destruction of the earth. We're not paying attention to political manipulation. We're not paying attention to how um, the neuroscience, the drugs are being administered or any of the um, problems or the colonialism 
in the spread in in exporting these drugs abroad like because we want homeostasis right we want to just we want to insulate ourselves in order to feel comfortable and and a sense of meaning and that is you know he he says right at the end there's still hope you know even though this has been a problem in the past, nowadays we know more about the brain and we can get over all that racism and um, authoritarianism and all that. I mean, he has clearly insulated himself from reality. And then he says, that's good. Uh, okay. Okay, so let's look at how his attitude toward nature. Let's look at whether um, it's also sexist. Um, Amal, did you want to? Do you want to comment? Actually, I was just wondering, and I want to ask you, like, um, like for Damasio, he thinks that uh, you know, uh, like our emotion arise from you know, uh, the neural uh, patterns that represent, you know, the changes in our body or brain. Uh, so does it support that we know that, like we have this stereotype or like women are emotional, so they cannot take actions um, like men uh, because, you know, they're, um, so th does he support this influence of emotions on thought? Well, that was his big deal, right? He was rejecting dualism. And he's saying that, I, let's see, I think, I can never get how he uses words, but I think it was emotion is your instant reaction to the outside world. And then feelings is when you start thinking about this, right? And then you link that to thought. And then you link that to, you know, some idea of the good. So. He doesn't say things like either that lots of people talk about this stuff all the time or that women in general talk about more about that than men. And so maybe we should pay more attention to women. They're actually more sophisticated and they have better neural maps than men. It's right. It's Apollonian reasoning that's dualistic or reductionistic, and actually women spend most of their lives examining emotions and feelings often of other people so they can get their families, you know, to get along together so they can get their kids raised and protect their kids from outside forces. I mean, he doesn't even mention that. And also that women's brains are actually wired in a way that's more connected than men, right? So that would be a no brainer, right, to say, to say, oh, you know, what people have said about women's brains, actually neuroscience confirms and men need to get, get on board. <laughs> he says the opposite, really. Just sell these wonderful drugs and you'll be saved. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, who else? Anybody else have their hand up? I guess not. Um, so Ashlyn, do you think any of this has a has a bias in it, um, sexual bias, or that men are associated with reason and reason is worshipped? And so it's more like if women can become more like men, when actually what he's saying about the importance of emotions is men should become more like women. Um, Right. Okay, Ashlyn. What do, and then the attitude toward nature. What do you think? <laughs> she disappeared. <laughs> that was Andy. No, she lost connection. Okay, Aisha, do you have something? Oh, yes. Um, not now that many things. Like so many points in the last chapter. Uh, you discussed, I mean, all the summary of your response, It, I felt these are like, you know, it's all about we are talking uh, everything today. 
So yeah, no, nothing new actually. Okay. Um, Masoma, anything new to say? Uh, professor, I was thinking uh, like he was kind of sexism maybe uh, because he was supporting this Apollyan Apol uh, gods and, and have this idea, but then he did not. I mean, he also mentioned about the emotions and everything and saying that's very important. But then he did not acknowledge that women uh, women might suffer even more if they got like you know misabused because they have strong emotions and uh, if it is a good point or or not. But then he did not acknowledge that uh, how a a a like you know treated his sister or the other woman, uh, and then uh, and he did not acknowledge that women have I mean women can suffer more in these conditions uh, or uh, yeah with a, so I, I think like uh, he he did not acknowledge those mistakes and uh, uh, he's just supporting this idea that this is something uh, natural and then we have to find a way the drugs the drug is the way but then yeah I think he did not yeah address those issues so I think he's kind of sexism well also to attack mother nature right mother nature is wicked and yeah out to get us that's really that's really sexist i'm sorry <laughs> uh it's a bad attitude um all right now is is gonna pass aurora do you want to say anything about just sexism right now and then i'll go again to the last chapter Falak? No, Professor. Diana? Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, where am I? Saida? Isabel? Fatima, Ashlyn, okay. All right, so the next chapter was humanities, right? The neuroscience and humanities education. So I thought, wow, this is great, you know? When I, I started reading it, I said, um, the neuroscience is rejecting the blank slate and dualism, and it's going, uh, moving toward integrated knowledge and a whole new paradigm. And it'll be, we should relook at all the disciplines in this new way that's more integrated. And I was going, okay. Okay, I'm on board. This is this is what I've been doing forever. I'm the only philosopher in my school. I work with the people in art. I work with theology. I work with the people in um, political politics. I work with everybody, right? Because I I like that integrated knowledge. Great. Um, but then you go along, and um, as you go along, you realize this is not integrated. And so, you know, at the end I say, well, even though he didn't do it, let's do it. Um, so the arts, right, that whole process, his big insight, right, is that the mind reason has, it's, you know, run by emotions and they're not just reactions, right? It's not that uh, emotion, passion versus reason, it's actually, emotional reactions and feelings this whole process of feelings is linking those outside influences to emotions and creating these neural maps where you have integrity like what you feel and what you do and what you think is all a piece well the whole uh process 
of linking emotions to feelings and examining and re-examining all that, that's what the arts are, right? That's the definition of the arts. The arts are, are trying to appeal to sensuality, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, um, and your imagination. So they try to you know, build from there. They start with sensuality. They create a narrative. They try to educate your imagination so you have this image of a good life or you have some, someone to imitate. And so Damasio himself writes, there's a number of chapters about Spinoza. He went to Spinoza's, where Spinoza had lived. He read about his life. Um, Spinoza himself ran afoul of the religious authorities and also the political authorities, but he just stayed at home, <laughs> right? He didn't, he didn't really have moral courage. He didn't become an activist. He didn't try to change anything. He just tried to stay alive. And that might've been appropriate for him given his life, but it's just not at all how most people live, right? If they want to live a good life, and if they are independent thinkers, um, they run afoul of the authorities. So anyway, um, the arts try to create scenarios of emotions and better ways to react and worse ways so that you develop a really sophisticated neural mapping, right? Your relationship between your thoughts, your feelings, your actions, all comes together. Um, and he, he just didn't give an adequate account of that. Um, let's see, the humanities has been marginalized and replaced with science in two ways, right? So science looks at facts, and that was the utilitarian tradition. But if everyone's a blank slate, and all you get is this pile of facts, and that's what history is, this pile of facts. And uh, so a number of PhDs in history, what you get your degree in is just to find another person and just describe their life just add to the pile of facts without claims about patterns because the idea that there are patterns assumes it's not a blank slate, that we have these same emotions that every time as a kid is born, they have to deal with pleasure and fear, which is incidentally common sense, but it's not what the enlightenment believed it could do and it's not the way academics get rewarded. So some of them are rewarded for just adding more facts. And some of them are rewarded for uh, coming up with some theory to impose uh, some new theory, right? Well, like the golden rule, let's just impose it. Let's just give it to ourselves from now on and everything will be peachy keen. <laughs> Okay, so um, so the when the humanities was respected, it was because people thought that we are a kind of instinctual being. We have this pretty primitive side. We have the brainstem and the limbic system, and we have to learn how to attach that to the ne neurocortex, neocortex in a way that assimilates that darkness into the culture so that people don't overreact and they don't uh, get to a pretty low level of existence. But Damasio doesn't talk like that. Um, and when he talks about integrative knowledge, he really, I don't think he means Right, he does not mean the Greeks, although he said that he did. Right, uh, I mean he just really contradicts himself, but he but he understands Aristotle 
as the contented life, the well-balanced life. Again, this homeostasis guy that sits in his office, just like Mr. Damasio does, and has aesthetic experiences. So Damasio's idea of the good life is you contemplate scientific discovery and how amazing it is, you know, that we've developed all this knowledge and you contemplate, you have aesthetic experiences. So he's listening to his classical music or whatever. And, um, and it's just, that's not what the arts were about with the Greeks, right? It wasn't just sitting and listening to classical music and feeling content with life. It was everybody comes, there are religious festivals and the public is expected to go and watch these tragedies and it's a contest. There are a lot of tragedians have submitted proposals and this council has picked three and each of, each of those tragedians uh, performs three tragedies and a satyr play, okay? And the satyr play is just sex and drunkenness and it's just wild, right? Because the tragedies were so serious, all of a sudden you have these crazy comedies to give you some relief. Um, but you're supposed to vote on the winner. So the way it's set up, pay attention, learn the lessons, uh, but it's not about being contented. It's about not being contented. It's about, geez, I thought I, I thought I knew about this, or oh my gosh, I could react like that. It's keeping yourself alert to the fact that you have to keep rewiring your neural map. You have to keep reconsidering. So, um, so aesthetic con contemplation <laughs> is not what you know, what Damasio, you learn, you, you go watch the tragedies and what they want you to do afterwards is, is be bold, be courageous, take on as many social and political roles as you can to develop yourself and also to develop your society so that it can keep evolving. And that also, so it doesn't avoid devolving, right? You have to watch out. You know, there's always that temptation for power and money and you've got to avoid it and you've got to stop other people from using rhetoric to manipulate people to go for power and money and war and collapse, eventually social collapse. So you've got to constantly be working on that. Um, let's see. Um, so, okay, so reading, it's during our debates over texts in history, philosophy, literature, we figure out our own characters and projections, and we realize other people have very different ideas of the good and evil justice and injustice. We realize we need to explain and give a rational count account of our worldview. It's not a given. It's not the only possible inference. And we also have to keep developing that, you know, that's obviously why I make you write your final papers that just tell me, well, where, so that you know, here's where I am right now. Um, you also have to accept the, pep, the fact that people disagree and not try to control other people, but figure out how to get get along. Um, let's see. And then my the last page, I use the five characteristics of a liberally minded adult from my catalog, which I think are really true. I mean, I like them I, for 25 years. I try to lecture every lecture to be sort of oriented that way. Um, so intellectual honesty, right? I just think you should be honest and say, I don't know if there's a God and I don't know if there's immortality. And then you have to say, but I think this is the way to live either way, right? And that every major religion, you know, promotes this. And I think it's right 
not with the ulterior motive of going to heaven, but with just because it's the right thing to do and it will leave a legacy behind. So, um, so intellectual honesty is important. And it also, when you admit you don't know, you're motivated to seek uh, greater wisdom, greater knowledge, commitment to truth, like some positions are better than others. Um, a society that's based on sexism is based on a lie. A society based on racism is based on a lie. Sometimes societies aren't based on those things, but that's the way they operate. That's a lie, right? In the way the people running the society are operating. So, and the truth about our relation to nature, you know, Damasio is completely lying to himself about that. Uh, fairness to opposing points of view. So you're fair. Um, patience with complexity and ambiguity. Um, there aren't simple solutions. And one of my criticisms of Damasio is oversimplistic. And then uh, tolerance of reasoned dissent. Someone can disagree with you, but they have to have reasons, right? They can't say you're just a liberal, right? That's not a reason. <laughs> you have to have reason why you think one thing and someone else think something else. And then you, if you're very specific about why you disagree, then if the truth comes out, one of you can adjust, change your mind. Um, so um, he says, Damasio says, we need to be, uh, to, he presents this invitation. We need a new breed of investigations aimed at testing hypotheses based on integrative knowledge from many other academic disciplines and neurobiology. And so that's what I did, right? I gave my response uh, based on a model of integrated knowledge and with the claim that this, this would have to do with neural mapping, even though the Greeks did not have all the machinery, you know, they don't have the little maps, literal physical maps when you get a CAT scan or something, but they got it, like they know what's going on. Um, just like Buddhist monks, when they're meditating, it their brains have been measured with CAT scans and people say, wow, that brain is really functioning well. It's like, yeah, really, why are you surprised, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, does anybody, so I'm gonna call on each of you about your thoughts about humanities, the humanities part of the education. What do you think, you know, you go to this liberal arts school, you have to take what, some kind of performance art, you have to take a history class, right? There's some humanities stuff you have to take. What do you think you're learning from the humanities part? And how do you think it fits with the other things that you're studying? Okay, Amal, what do you think? Um, uh, so I'm thinking, uh, so in a liberal arts in, in institution, you get to know like many things and that, you know, lead you to understand the complexity of um, like human life. So uh, I think like we learn about, like we learn a, a lot about many things and still like this, uh, you know, it lead us to ask more questions or, you know, seek to, for, uh, to get, you know, more knowledge about different topics. So uh, yeah, let me get, <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about, uh, for an example, like we need to have like to to seek the truth and you know to understand like how our position in the world. So I guess like uh, uh, we need to use our like the power of uh, thought 
And I'm just saying random things because I, I was like thinking about that to give an example. I will add later if I have. Okay, so if you wanted to write your final paper on uh, a healthy psyche and liberal arts education or how liberal arts education is trying to um, encourage students to form a, a healthy psyche, something like that. So I can write, I'll write that as a possible paper topic uh, because I think it would be a good one, right? If you tell yourself, you know, I'm going to be committed to truth, I'm going to be intellectually honest, I'm going to do this, that could be a healthy psyche, right? Yes. And then you'd give examples and stuff like that. Okay. But I actually, if you write on that, I really would like you to bring in what you've learned from other classes, because that's, to me, it's truly interesting, because I went to school when, in the 60s, and all the requirements were abolished and you didn't have to do anything you didn't want to do. So I took a lot of humanities and I did not take very much science or social science. I took a science class where I read six books and did book reports and I took a social science for six weeks. And um, so I'm really defective and I didn't have to take math. So, you know, I like it when students tell me how they link it because they know more than I know <laughs> about these things. And it's, you know, you might think I'm just being fakey, but I'm not, right? I learn a lot from that. But I also think that you learn when you have to tell me how you're putting it together, you literally are teaching yourself how you're putting it together, right? You, okay, good. You're giving yourself your own guideline or you're giving yourself that final reflection, which is really another layer of the neural map. Ha ha. <laughs> you're giving, you're increasing your map. Okay, you want to do that for sure. Um, okay, so I, I guess I'll start. Anything else, Amal? Uh, for now, no. Okay. okay, okay, Masoma's got her hand up, unless that's left over from last time. Uh, no, Professor, I raised my hand uh, because my my phone battery is about to die, so I want to give okay. my opinion and then maybe I get yeah, Go ahead. disconnected. So, Professor, uh, I think, yeah, humanitarian science is very, very important, and I, I found it very like you know uh interesting uh and important that people all the people should you know follow this and and in my view uh a humanitarian science is uh, a science that is intellectually honest and you know they always reflect on their uh life opinion and emotions the it's more like a kind of virtue uh, ethics kind of thinking so i was thinking that the i mean i read the uh, last chapter um, uh, so I, I found it very interesting and then uh, i think this is very important i mean like i powers i mean ideas are are very powerful and and people should always reflect themselves to find a way how to flourish and how to live and it's, it's not like we are blank slate and and we will be completely affected by our environment and if i'm like you know uh, if I, I I lived in Afghanistan, I will follow the same culture, and I would agree with all of the things here because I brought up with these ideas, and and uh, it kind of affect. But then I think like it's always always about. I mean, we human beings have this ability, but they they also should be intellectually honest what they learn, and uh, and always they should reflect. I think reflecting, uh. On, on our ideas and beliefs and everything is very very important and and it's not like we uh, I mean it changes opinions and, and it get better and we flourish and and we found ourselves uh, I mean if we find the the way how to live and what, what's a meaningful life for the human beings uh, then it would be more convincing because you are not you know, just supporting blindly an idea, but you yourself find it convincing and find your way how to live. So I think it's always important that people them, themselves should reflect on their views and ideas and then uh, find their ways. So I think, uh, yeah. 
Okay, so, me, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Professor, just to sum up, so for me that, you know, uh, people uh, should like reflect on their uh, life and then it's not like my culture is based and the other one is not. Uh, these are different and each culture have uh, their own, uh, you know, meaningful or good ways of life. Uh, so I don't want to judge that this, this culture is good or this culture is not good or this not. Everyone should reflect uh, and find their own way of life and meaningful life because we are different. And this, this are kind of, uh, I mean, affect us. So given this, uh, uh, people should reflect on their idea and find their own way of uh, meaningful life. And it's, it might not work for everyone. So. Okay, so good. Um, I think our capacity for reflection is necessary. I mean, if without it, children learn by habit and imitation, right? They're dependent for so long. But when people don't get past that, then you get racism, nationalism, authoritarianism, right? Because people aren't thinking. <laughs> they, they won't question. And so you just appeal to fear and pleasure and that's it. So reflection is necessary for any kind of meaningful life. Um, but unlike Damasio, I'm not going to say that's all you need, right? Like science is, are the heroes or, no, no. I mean, people who get into reflection like me um, don't act, right? And lots of times people who are good at reflecting are not good at acting. They're not good at persuading people they're not good at inspiring people, right? And so um, it really takes a lot of different gifts and it takes a lot of different uh, people oriented in different ways to talk to each other and converse with each other. No one person is gonna can do it. It's a culture, right? And But it definitely will always involve that reflective process. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, so here's Falak. Good. Humanities helps us develop a better worldview. It makes a person educated, but not specifically for a profession. That's right. Uh, you're educated for um, being a good citizen. I think being a better parent, better friend, you know, human being in general. <laughs> um, and more open to people you don't know personally. That's a citizenship thing. Um, and then also international relations. Um, okay, Isabel, what you got? Um, can you hear me, Professor? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Professor, um, for humanities, humanities, it's all about how uh, we are concerned about the uh, human values, especially like how we can see the life of people who are living um, with equal potential. For example, like men and women are having the same rights to do anything in their lives. So this is one part of the uh, liberal art education that teaches us on how to live in a healthy psyche. For example, like in the past, especially for um, most of the Asian countries faces this kind of issues, especially for like kind of patriarchal issues. So they face a lot of uh, injustice, or especially women have no rights to do a lot of things in their lives. So this actually leads them to face a lot of unhealthy psyche in their lives. And they cannot enjoy or get flourish to, to do whatever they want in their lives. So yeah, it's... That's, that's what I'm thinking, Professor. Okay, good. Um, who else, Ashlyn? Yes, Professor. So um, when I'm thinking from a very different, uh, like a different perspective, I could uh, understand the kind of flip I had uh, in terms of education with the previous education I have pursued. Because the previous education before coming to AUW, it was very like a theory based 
and we are uh, we are studying something uh, already existed like all the scientific things by hearting we are just for the exam sake and i was actually uh, thinking what the what how can it be practically applied into our lives studying some chan course in terms of mathematics or something how can it be taken into a long term purpose than the you know professional side if you are going to teach some uh, teach students it, it it is actually useful but when come when coming to a practical life or to apply those things into the practical life i i've always doubted what i have gained so far so when i actually came to aw so uh, it was uh, it was very different from the things that i had studied uh, i got to uh, see many as you have told many performing arts initially I, performing arts is one of our core courses as well so we have to take it initially i took pantomime initially i found it a bit weird because it was not the thing that i used to study back in you know uh, back in my school it's just something we used to do for fun or just for some arts cultural events or something but here we are taking it as a course so initially i found it a bit weird but when i look back to the uh, courses i have taken i have taken it in my first semester and first summer semester in aw so when i look back to all the courses that i have taken pantomime is one of my favorite courses that i had so far so you know i can completely understand the flip i had uh, when uh, when i took the pantomime and uh, compared to the other courses uh, compared to the other subjects that i have taken back in my high school and again uh, if i could uh, say about one of the as isabel also told uh, one of the courses i have taken feminism feminism is one of the courses i have taken so that course uh, Uh, actually was a game changer to me even if i know that okay uh, uh, okay there should be equality or something um, uh, uh, there should be equality and feminism is an authority to uh, do that but uh, since i was caught up in my culture and since patriarchy hold, uh, holds a very important uh plays in that but i actually didn't get into that feminism authority as a whole to understand the uh equality in terms of that particular authority but when i when i have taken feminism and when we had discussion about everything that that is when i that is actually one one of my eye openers uh i would say when when i understood yeah equality is just is just that important and it's very simple yet complicated thing to be uh, advocated so uh, the courses that offered in aw since we had the as i'm all, always telling in the class and the post since we have the opportunity to do the reasoning so that's what i actually found very good in terms of the liberal arts education so aw uh, was of course a game changer to all my views and the things i already have perceived from my um previous education professor okay good um again you can this is what you can uh write in your final paper right um yeah. who was your teacher uh, for feminism that was professor naomi shri yes okay she's i like her a lot you know yeah and uh i think she taught a whole course in ecological feminism and that was my favorite branch because it's connected to environmental stuff and uh the way you treat nature right mother nature so anyway i just remember when i met her when i was there and we went out to lunch at some pizza hut place i mean i just loved her right away and uh, i just miss right i miss my colleagues i thought they were great i i really like mr homer too Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, and I like Dr. Cohn, and yeah, it. I miss him. <laughs> you probably do too. But anyway, we can't whine. You have to be strong. Okay. Okay, Asia. What have you got? Oh, okay. Professor Ashley has already told uh, about. Uh, I mean, how a course can play. a game changing role so you know when uh, for all of us the 13 people uh, me fardin and fatima and, and many other so we took your course right the god this month and uh, at that point you know beforehand um whatever i have 
um, done so far in my high school and everywhere. It was like about the technical stuff. I mean, okay, so this is the theory of science. This is this. I have to calculate. I have to do this. But after taking your course, and I felt like um, it was something new to me. I mean, we were doing some self-reflection. So that's what humanities actually meant to me. I mean, we need to do some sort of self-reflection and uh, um, we can understand how our emotions are um, like um, what revolving around everything. So yeah, so it really taught me to um, step back and do what your stance is. So to understand our stance. That's what humanities actually meant to me. Okay, Amal, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so Ashton just reminded me of something. Uh, I wanna just comment on how powerful the liberal arts education in terms of, you know, uh, this trait of uh, the fairness of opposing points of view. So when it, uh, also in my previous education, like in our country, um, for, for example, many classes at school we have we had to uh, like philosophy class, but like you cannot speak anything. Like you have the freedom of speech, but you cannot criticize laws. You cannot criticize anything. You know, Be, that's because of the system of the country, like yeah, dictatorship in some way. So, <laughs> I uh, yeah, we always had the fear, you know. But like I never learned because I could not ask anyone anything and. Um, but here in AEW, and especially in this class, like I learned a lot and because I can I can be expressive and like if if we didn't ask and you know discuss with others, we cannot learn and uh, you know reflect on many things. So that's very powerful like like that now I have I have the freedom to uh, right. say my opinion. yeah, that's. Basically, you have a basically. free mind, right? Liberal education yeah. is to liberate your mind. Yeah, and then hold yourself accountable for what you say, right? And yeah, okay, go ahead, Ashlyn. So when Ahmal told that uh, another point popped up in my mind, Professor, it's like when I used to, as Amal told, when we used to study here in our country, we are taught something which is already there. And even if that that particular principle or something doesn't even make sense to us or we disagree with the idea, we didn't have the guts or we didn't have that thought of asking or uh, showing our disapproval to that particular principle. But it's just like you are going with the flow. You are, you are completely blindly taking everything inside what your teacher teaches. You are considering that everything she or he teaches is true. So that was the idea we uh, had. I had, I, I'm not being general, I had in my uh, education system before. But when I came to AW, the very beautiful things I found is that even if we are having a disagreement with one of the principles or something that we that is being taught, we can actually openly tell that no, no, none of the professors shown their disagreement or their, uh, their kind of uh, they haven't felt any bad when we are telling it. They they kind of supported us for being honest and for being telling what we actually felt. So I think that is one of the important uh, qualities of uh, liberal arts education, Professor. Isn't it kind of obvious that thoughts cause thoughts and they change your neural mapping and your chemistry, right? So now you're excited, obviously. Like, Mr. Damasio, aren't you a little full of yourself when you think, oh, I invented this new way. Like, oh, come on. Don't be so ignorant. You're so full of yourself, buddy. <laughs> anyway, okay, Miss, uh, now are you still, anything you want to say now? Um, I want to give everybody um uh a chance to um to respond once more um falak anything falak are you there i think humanities education 
where am I? Oh, enables us to learn more about cultures, knowing yourself, having skills, learning more about life related things. But people in our country think humanities are for the weak students. What they learn is not going to help them in a job as, as Follick says. Okay, this is Saida. Um, all right. Um, and so people try to learn science and business studies. But I think even before doing science, business and science, we are taught everything in general, like history, religion, and all. So those also are important. Here in AUW, they make sure we learn everything regardless of our background. I haven't taken any humanities courses yet, so I don't have any comments. But before AUW, we learned memorizing and passing or getting grades. Now we have to reflect uh, in our education with our own life and that's different. And I agree with Amal that disagreeing with the teachers is really a whole new thing. Okay, we would just study the way they reflect. I mean, I would commit suicide if I gave tests where all the answers were the same, you know, and I just ran students through and actually learned nothing about them, right? I mean, I just, to me, I learn about a student through their papers and they, hopefully they learn about themselves through their papers. Um, and so um, I, sometimes I see a student at Lyon and I, I tell them, oh, I just remember that, like they're graduating and I'll say, oh, I remember that paper you wrote a couple of years ago. And like, they had forgotten it, you know? <laughs> And, and, and I remember it because I always remember the papers that are sort of like the light bulb goes off and they hadn't thought about it and they think about it and it's a good thought. And it's like, wow, I can think about this. Um, so, you know, that's always really nice. Um, Diana, do you have a comment? Uh, professor, at first I thought that I have misunderstood the question, but I was correct. So I have studied and not in my own country. In a, I have studied the my school in Pakistan, but I I am from Afghanistan, so it was not easy to handle all the things. Uh, but the point was that we were just preparing, and reading and remembering those lines to remember everything, and on the exam holiday, so we was just writing line by lines, word by words. So actually that was not, I, after graduating, I was thinking that it was not learning process. It was remembering process. So I was, I, I was not really interesting on those systems. And I was not really an active member in the school, though I was trying to be active, but because of those system was not matching to my habits and I was not, I was not happy or being satisfied with those system. But when I came to AEW, everything was different. And um, uh, because in my community that I have grown up, so there was only chance to get in school. There was nothing, um, that you can be uh, a social activist or you can be a person that you want to be or you can you continue your education. So that was the full stop when you graduate from uh, 12th grade. That was the full stop. So uh, when I came to AW, on the I found myself that now I have chose a university that I can grown up and I can learn something. And when I was taking the uh, art courses, so it was totally different because in school, I didn't perform a single performance on there. But in AEW, when I was taking, um, uh, why I forget the course name. Uh, I forget the course name, sorry. So when I was taking the, it was, um, Masood Rahman's class. Ashlyn, can you help me? Which course was that? <laughs> that we are acting? Oh, uh, no. Dear speech. Verbal acting. 
Yes. Verbal acting, yes. <laughs> Why I forget this? So I took that course mm -hmm. and I was performing and I didn't know that, okay, might be I can, uh, for sometimes I can be uh, an actress. And when I was uh, performing on the stage and he said that you're amazing, you're performing the way that you need to do. And I was surprised about myself that can I act as an actress? On that time I found a and I remember that in practice, I got the best actress uh, when I when we was performing the drama. And uh, that was amazing. And beside that, I was a science student. And I was the way that I was handling those things. And uh, I found the about the ability of the person that a person can be creative and they can be in, uh, they can be a scientist and artist and they can be um, uh, multitasker. On that time I found and I understood. So uh, I was really unsatisfied the way that we had the system in our school and still, unfortunately we have those things. Even in Afghanistan, they have those systems. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, yeah, I think the creativity. So, well, the thing about performance, is that I think that was my weakest part of my whole career is I couldn't stand in front of the class and just sort of <clears throat> perform, right? I couldn't do that because I would look out at the students and two thirds of them are glaring at me because they don't wanna take this class. And I couldn't like get over it and just perform, you know? I would, I just reacted and um, so, so performance, you don't have to be an actress. Actually, it will help you in every aspect of your job, right? Mm -hmm. Any kind of business job, definitely. But any job where you have to report your findings to somebody else, that performance thing, you know, that ability mm -hmm. to get up there and command attention, right? That's mm -hmm. really important. Um, so good for you. <laughs> yeah professor because we never had those chances in our high school though we could grow up better but we never have those things so i yeah. think we need a lot of changes a lot well you know you could even start a little um club at AUW. Uh, professor actually my brother um they they uh, they had a school uh, but because of the security system so we become uh, to sell the school and school is, is still there and they are still going on, but that is not now in our under control. So that's why because of the security and because of the Afghan situation, we cannot take and we that taking the responsibility is actually not an easy work. So that's why we sell the school to another, another person. Um. Oh, let's see, what was I going to say? I can't remember, but um, yeah, performance is important. Knowing how to command attention. Oh, yeah, I was going to say you could start a group, you know, at AUW because there's so many clubs, unless there already is one, but it could be just a performance club or a speech club where you, you know, you just perform and you can announce, you know, that someone's going to give a performance and um, just keep your skills up. Um, I know there are lots of clubs. I went to the club carnival or whatever you call it and checked out, you know, and um, I, like Asia said, I taught the Greek goddesses and there's seven. And so, you know, there were the students in the, um, what, supporting animals, you know, making sure animals get treated right. Well, that's Artemis. And then there are the sports ones, that's Artemis. And then there's the ones on the Student Government Association, that's Athena. And I know Mr. Homer is the advisor and I used to go to their meetings too, which were really fun and insightful. And then there were actually, there was a psychology group for, you know, kids, students that were needing uh, to someone to talk to, right? That's Persephone. Um, so anyway, it, it went on and on, but 
the the club thing is is a big part of liberal arts education because the students take initiative and they form a club and they write their club rules and regulations and they govern themselves right and then they also do it according to some further aspect of their capacities that they want to develop and what they think the world needs and all that stuff. So that's very much a part of liberal education. Um, so let me just, um, if what I wanted to do was go back over the syllabus to remind you what we covered. And then right now it, it seems like, <laughs> But you can, again, I never want to force students. If there's some particular issue a student wanted to talk about, go for it. But if you want to do the whole liberal arts thing, right? Like um, uh, the life of the mind and liberal arts education or a free mind or, I mean, I'll just write down some possibilities. But, um, okay, so you remember one of the first assignments was Seneca's On Tranquility of Mind. And the students wrote letters to themselves or letters. A number of them wrote some really wonderful uh, letters. And so, um, so they, they, you know, students at AUW are thinking about strength of mind and resilience and resistance. And so, so that's an issue. And if it's okay with those students, I'll have to ask them permission. Next time I teach this course, I'm not gonna assign that difficult letter. I will assign a few of the letters that my students wrote uh, because this isn't something you grow out of. It's not something that takes a high IQ, although you can do it more systematically where most people most people don't because they don't get exposed to it. But also most people are much more immediate. They're not going to think about their whole life systematically. Um, but in a liberal arts setting, then they have to, at least for a while. So that was the way we started. And then we talked about, if you remember, Augustine and free will and choosing the eternal over the temporal and mathematics. So if that was something, you know, that punched a button that you liked, but I also had a woman who was raised with a lot of guilt, right? And so then there's that idea of what is a healthy psyche. Um, then there was the readings from St. Thomas where you, and Martin Luther King Jr., where you unite, unified reason and faith, but it was natural law theory, and then that was social justice activism. So if you wanted to focus on that or include that in your view of a healthy psyche, um, then we had utilitarianism and the modern paradigm of the blank slate and happiness. So you can, I hope you can see that Mr. Damasio um, talks about religion, but he doesn't really, <laughs> You know, he doesn't get to any specifics. Uh, and also when push came to shove, he's much more like, he rejects utilitarianism, he rejects Kant, but his own view is much more blank slate, a pill will fix you, <laughs> my version of utilitarianism than he realizes, I think. Um, okay, so then we had, utilitarianism, pleasure, pain, happiness. And then Mr. Hedges talked about how that can get corrupted into positive psychology. Uh, I also had you read that article about the virtue of an educated voter. So in a, if you want a free and open society, that was another thing I criticized Damasio for. He just said, there's two paths to God and he just, uh, one is you start with a free, so, uh, free democratic society, and then you, you know, get involved with uh, institutional group religion. Or the other one is you start with this free society, and you have the intellectual path. 
But I mean, Mr. Damasio never thinks about how people lose their free and open societies, right? And how they, I mean, it's so much more complicated than Mr. Damasio just thinks. Anyway, so the virtue of an educated voter is that learning how to think like a citizen. Um, then I did Kant, the dualism. Then we did moral relativism. You remember that? That Ruth Benedict said, uh, morality is a convenient term for socially approved habits, custom habit and imitation. But she herself was at this higher level of critical thinking because she's, she's telling Americans about in other societies, homosexuality is fine. This attitude toward your yam seeds is fine. So get over it, Americans. Well, she's saying that bigotry is bad and critical thinking is good, right? <laughs> so she's, you know, anyway, it's so convoluted, just like Damasio, and they do not realize the baggage that they bring in with them, right? They can't see themselves. Um, so so um, the liberal arts model is not moral relativism, right? An examined life is not, you can think anything you like, but it also is against just that fixated thinking where this is absolutely right. Like Kant would go for moral absolutes and a liberally minded person would say, it depends, the person decides which principle is relevant in a situation and how it applies. And so in Greek tragedy, people always have some kind of moral principle, but they make mistakes. And so Kant doesn't understand that, the nuance. Benedict doesn't understand. Um, and then I did, the UN's model of human rights and capabilities. If you remember that, I wrote uh, that essay about women's rights and human capabilities. And then we talked about racism, uh, Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass and how ripping children away from their mothers, how the way they, you know, slavery is never gonna be it will always be evil. It doesn't matter if people adjust to it or not. It's completely unnatural. So that's a response to Ruth Benedict that there are institutions that people find, you know, societies are based on that a lot of people accept, but they're completely wrong and they're evil. And you can say that, right? They completely go against basic natural drives. I mean, our basic humanity, you can get down to that basic humanity and say, it's always wrong to treat people like property. It's always wrong to rip children away from their mothers. It's always wrong to beat people, right? For things they didn't do. It's always, you know, there's certain, it's always wrong to starve people. It's always, you know, it's always wrong to get them drunk on a holiday so that they go back to their servile position. Anyway, so that kind of thing. And then we had those articles about Muslim women and how the one article was that learning how to read was her way out, right? That was the same with Frederick Douglass. So the, the power of education in a healthy psyche, you know, someone might want to write about that. Then um, there was nomad, right? The woman who said Islam is necessarily bad and awful. And what you could say is that she had, again, her thinking was too fixated. It was too narrow. It was, um, and then she also idealized enlightenment thinking. And Fardin pointed out that you know, the Enlightenment thinkers did a lot of nasty things in the name of reason, right? Historically. So she shouldn't have idealized it that much. Anyway, so we did that. Then we did humanism, power of humanism. Um, I did talk about systems thinking and how that connects to the sciences and what we're learning about the biosphere and the ecosphere and all that today. 
and then um, um, I think I did an article on feminism, right? Um, feminist critiques of Western based. Okay, anyway, I can't quite uh, remember actually the reading for that. I can't quite remember. And then we did neuroscience. So I think the neuroscience um, brings in a lot of themes from the class, but it also attaches to current therapies, like what your research paper is supposed to be, some kind of therapies or ways that psychology is practiced. And so you, um, you look up something and then you might want to look up neuroscience for all I care, but other therapies, humanist psychology, whatever. And then you can look and see what sort of view of the psyche are they based on? And um, is it a blank slate? Is it moral relativism? Is it dualism? Is it neuroscience? Is it like, what is it that they have in the back of their mind as they um, engage in this particular kind of therapy. Um, so, uh, you know, that's it. And um, if anybody has questions, you can stay after. Otherwise, you know, it is 10 to it's 20 minutes early. I was going to try and let you go 30 minutes early. So you could actually work on your posts. Um, and I will write uh, in the la in the stream, I'll start formulating questions about what the final could be on related to liberal arts and all that stuff. Um, I might, what I'd like to do is I'll take the mission statement of AUW and you could write on, does this fit with the, the a notion of a healthy psyche, right? Um, according to things I've read in this class or Damasio, it's better than Damasio, right? He, he's, he's right about neurals, you know, neural maps and ideas, but AUW has got a better idea of how to do it than he does or something like that, right? Um, so you might want to relook at the mission uh, in light of what we've studied about healthy psyche. I definitely think human beings cannot be healthy unless they have the opportunity to speak their mind, but also they have to be made accountable, right? Because Americans right now are speaking their mind and destroying democracy because they're believing in all these conspiracy theories and all these ways they're getting manipulated. So it has to be a combination of speaking your mind and holding yourself accountable for a reasonable point of view. Does that make sense? <laughs> Treating yourself like a mindful mind, like someone who actually was given the gift of the power of the mind. Now, whether if you think it's the result of evolution or the result of some God or whatever, I don't care where you think it came from. I think you have it and you should use it. Okay, well, I'll let you go. And then if you wanna stay after and talk, that's fine. And then I'll see you on Tuesday the 27th, right? And that'll be it. With your prepared to discuss your research paper and the outline for your final paper. Okay, professor. professor, I have a question. Okay, other people can go if they're done, it's fine. Go ahead, Diana. Uh, professor, do we need to make a very simple slide for our outline to present or no need? Do you have to make what? A slide presentation. Oh, no. Okay. No. So we can only talk, I mean, mention what we are you can do you can do a slide presentation, right? Especially the students who can't all we see is their face. Um, it's just that you know I like looking at a face, but in the slide presentations they do have that picture of your face over there. So 
I won't require it, Diana, because I think it's good for people to listen and follow an argument. Uh, I mean, the trouble with me is I'm auditory. So I listen anyway. Other people are visual, but even visual people need to learn how to be auditory and think without an image in front of them. All right, Professor. So just in simple way, we can make our outline and present, but can I know the time? The, I mean, the timing, that how many minutes we need to present? Well, I mean, how many students will be there? 10, maybe. And um, 20, maybe. we have... That is not optional, right, Professor? It's not optional. I know, but classes aren't optional. A lot of students just have trouble, you know, with their electricity or whatever. No, it's not optional. But how many people came today, you know, 10, 12, maybe? I mean, I guess five minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, there has to be some limit because everyone presents twice. And you've got maybe let's say 15 people. So that'll be 30 presentations and five minutes each would be within the time frame, right? Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Professor, because sure. I need to fix a timing and to prepare for that. That's why I was asking. And so Professor today, because I got vaccinated, so I have a lot of pain. That's why I couldn't participate much. Okay, yeah, my grandson got his second one yesterday. No, <laughs> Professor, my one was only one. It was having one cycle, so it was having a lots of pain. Yeah, yeah. And, and I got fever, I got That's headache. Too bad. I mean, it's funny because older people tend not to have as many side effects. So, you know, no prob. I didn't have any prob, but all these young people are suffering so much. Uh, yeah. Professor? But, yeah? Uh, for the presentation, so basically the goal is to just present what we have written, but it's not like a kind of, I mean, it's not required to, to have a PowerPoint slide, something like that. No, so slides just, are not required. Yeah, you don't have to do PowerPoint slides. Um, you certainly can, but. All right, thank you, Professor. Sure. Um, okay, so. Um, Professor, I have one question. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, so in, in humanistic therapy, it is given that uh, it believes in free will and the uh, choice for practical decisions. So does it mean that it follows Aristotle virtues and uh, Kant's theory? Well, what do you think? I think yes. Okay, so let's see. It emphasizes what? Freedom and what? Free will and uh, the uh, choices to make practical decisions. Okay. Um, as opposed to what? <laughs> I mean, who doesn't think that, right? Yeah. Okay, so so that's what is like, what do they have in their mind? Is it as opposed to determinism, right? That people really are just determined? Um, why would they go to therapy, right? I think the whole idea of therapy is to get people, you know, to think. Um, yeah. And then what was freedom and, okay. So the other thing is, is there any standard of good and evil according to which they have to, you know, uh, they're accountable for their free decisions or is it strict relativism? Um, as long as they're willing to take responsibility, you know, for their choice or as long as the other people consent um, they can do what they want. So, so uh, Falak, this is a big problem, is that 
you can go back to that article of virtue of an educated voter where the emphasis there was people have to learn how to how to be good citizens and that's a level of self-control awareness of the public good public safety public this and that and they have to decide that personal freedom is not about the freedom to ignore everybody else right mm -hmm. um, and so Follick, uh, the U.S., for example, is a great case of where a certain interpretation of humanistic psychology, and you could say it's a misinterpretation, you can, but I mean, if all it is is freedom and moral relativism or uh, just, you know, choosing what you want, they're never going to develop uh, awareness of public being a citizen, and that's what's happened in the U.S., People don't want to put on masks. They don't feel like it, you know? They're free to do what they want. They don't have to get a vaccine. That's a stupid government is a fascist dictatorship. And what it is, is they don't have a citizenship consciousness. They don't think about public health, public safety. They don't think about the fact if they get sick, they're gonna go to a hospital and subject the people who work there to their sickness just because they were irresponsible. So I guess Follick, unless you can think of something else, you could go back to that virtue of an educated voter and just say, does humanistic psychology encourage people to think about other people? Uh, okay, Professor, sure. Yeah, I, I don't know how far that can take you, but. And it is more than just consent, right? Somebody, yeah, two people could consent to have an open marriage where they have as many sex partners as they want, but the children might feel really insecure about that, right? Or, I mean, there, there, there are other social problems when people don't make sexual commitments, long-term sexual commitments. There's a lot of social problems in that. Um, professor, actually, uh, humanistic therapy is positive because it believes that every human is uh, innately good and they will choose uh, positive paths for themselves. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, you know, go ahead, Falak, chew it up, spit it out, figure out how that's too simplistic. Does that make sense, Falak? Yeah. yeah, Professor. I'm sorry to tell you that grown-ups uh, aren't necessarily deep thinkers. <laughs> Even if they have big degrees, you know. So, uh, professor, yeah, go uh, ahead. my thesis statement, can you just uh, give me some idea? Well, let's see. Um, well, you have to do some research. Um, but I'm going to argue that humanistic psychology is very enlightenment based and that all the problems that we've seen from that kind of psychology for the last 300 years uh, still occur. <laughs> oh, right? Or humanistic psychologies have not learned the lessons about the corruption of that point of view that have occurred ever since uh, you, John Stuart Mill presented that kind of humanistic point of view or something like that. You could do that. Um, you could do, um, anyway. So, I mean, you can come talk to me, but you do have to do research into the background of it. When did it start? Um, so Follick, for example, do you remember the woman who was raised with this view of sin, right? The people yeah. are bad. And so, you know, you could have in your paper, it's understandable that it was a reaction against that. And maybe there's historical evidence that it was a reaction against that. But then Aristotle says people are born neither virtuous nor vicious. 
but it's their upbringing that forms them in a certain way. And there's certain ways of being formed are better than others. And, you know, the importance of uh, learning how to rule for the benefit of the rule, learning how to use your position of authority in every situation where you have it for the well-being of the people over whom you have it. And you're never going to get from freedom, you know, to do what you like, to the importance of ruling for the benefit of the ruled. You're never going to get there. Um, yeah, professor. Or utilitarianism, pleasure, pain, and happiness. You're never going to get from telling people, go ahead and be happy, and they'll end up being wise. Right, Falak? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty sad, pretty sad. <laughs> but you can be wise, Falak. You can be a wise, wise old woman and write your paper. Yeah, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Okay, Isabel. Professor, um, actually, I want to talk uh, a little bit more about the humanistic education, especially the one that we discussed today. So can you please like elaborate more about it? Because... Well, what was Aristotle's model of the soul, right? A healthy psyche? Yeah. So you can go back to that. You can go to that article about women's rights. That might be interesting to you because you're, you know, that's of interest to you is the notion of rights and equal rights. So if you go back to that day that we did the United Nations and we did that paper on Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, and then... Uh, professor, sorry to interrupt, but you forgot to stop the recording. What? Uh, yes. You, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, know, you know, I didn't stop it during the break either. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you. 